We were discussing something that we call research to energy research, climate research, also nuclear research are affiliated with, uh, with uh, surrounding universities. Uh, for example, I myself are at the University of Cologne, but there is the University of Aachen, Düsseldorf, Bochum, Bonn, many uh, in, in the federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia. Okay, now I would like to tell you uh, a little bit from the experimentalist point of view about the fate of antimatter and uh, kind of a provocative uh, exist. So I will try to show you um, how, how these two questions are connected. And I will, uh, what also Anne started with uh, Big Bang and in Leeds, uh, it, hey, are we here? For photon, for example, you produce pairs of particles. What you see in this picture, it's a very famous picture actually about uh, pair production, uh, electron positron pairs, uh, bubbles, or uh, probably a uh, uh, Lorentz force, then uh, particles with the same velocity, the same velocity vector, but different charges are bent to the left or to the right. Sorry, to the yeah, from your side to the left or to the right. Okay. Uh, one question that you might, may ask yourself, why is then, uh, why are there three particles there and not two? This is a leave for you to uh, think about. Uh, for the time being, I don't answer the question. Okay, so these are the uh, electrons, the green ones, and the red ones are the positrons. And uh, I hope I keep this notation, this color notation, during my talk. Okay, so as I said, in the Big Bang, we assume that particles and an equal amount of antiparticles was produced from energy. And we had different species of particles, like leptons, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, neutrons, and so on and so on. And by chance, or because the density was so large, so high, you could produce hydrogen with a proton in the center as a nucleus, and uh, in, the in the cloud around the nucleus, the electron, that we call matter, or you could have an antiproton and a positron. So the antiproton is identical to the proton except for the charge. And the positron is identical to the electron except for the charge. So you can have these two uh, appearances of matter. Or, yeah. One is what we call matter and the other thing is what we call antimatter. Now, of course, you may know that if matter and antimatter come together, same species, like an electron and a positron, they meet each other, then they annihilate. So from matter, light is produced. This is indicated here, particle and an antiparticle meet and they produce light. You know this probably very well from uh, uh, medical uh, uh, surveys that are done, which is called uh, positron emission tomography. So we have a patient here. This patient is injected a radioactive tracer. If you use a special molecule, it, for example, accumulates in the brain. And then this one part of this molecule is radioactive and emits a positron. This positron travels a little bit through the brain 
until it hits an electron and they annihilate and produce two photons back to back because of uh, energy and momentum conservation. These are in this case 500 keV electrons, uh, sorry, photons and you put a ring of scintillator detectors around the head and they are detected in coincidence. They are traced back. You do it many times and you then get the nice pictures from your brain and maybe in a very bad case you detect a brain cancer for example. Okay, but the principle is pairwise annihilation of matter and antimatter. So then again the question is if I were to meet you and you were made out of antimatter I bet I would not shake your hands right because we would annihilate in a flash of light and we have to be we would have to be very careful. So in principle if there is an equal amount of matter and antimatter at the beginning, why does the universe not look like that, only comprised of photons? Instead, of course, we know that if we look to certain regions of the universe, it looks like that. There are millions and millions of stars and galaxies and things like that. And this is what we call the puzzle of our existence. So I put it here, we recently or some time ago, we produced a, a nice uh, volume of our, our local newspaper or in the research center which we call FZ uh, with the question, why the hell is there, isn't there nothing? Yeah, so we're part of the universe. Uh, question, I think, uh, this equation, sorry, this, uh, the one equation that I wasn't sure. Two solutions of this equation. One is the positive energy. We must regard it rather as an accident that the Earth and presumably the whole solar system contains a preponderance of negative electrons and positive protons. Some of the stars, it is the other way about. These stars, um, how is it called international? By chance, you might be able to uh, observe it. Anyway, this AMS is a detector which has uh, magnets and tracking chambers and so on in, and it will also, by the deflection of particles that pass through it, identify whether it's positively charged or negatively charged. Yeah, and then you have other possibilities to identify whether it's a particle or an antiparticle. Now if this detector actually was uh, brought to uh, the ISS with the last space shuttle mission that uh, ever took place and it was only possible by a presidential decree uh, that uh, this would take the, I, uh, the AMS to the ISS uh, and this was possible only because the, uh, this spectrometer, the spokesperson of this spectrometer is Sam Ting, another uh, Nobel Prize winner for the JPSI. Okay, anyway, so this can search for antimatter and for example if they would detect a carbon, anti-carbon nucleus, it would be clear that there must be anti-worlds around. So this is one of the motivations to search for this with the a a AMS. But, okay, so um, coming back to uh, Sam Ting, uh, sorry, to uh, Paul Dirac, uh, the his quote starts like this. He says, if we accept the view of complete symmetry between positive and negative electric charge as far as the fundamental laws of nature is concerned. Then uh, the second part of the quote with, the, with matter 
and uh, preponderance of matter and uh, antimatter, uh, this uh, would be uh, possible. Now, uh, this uh, shows how important symmetries are in nature. And I will come now a little bit to symmetries, so symmetrical objects like snowflakes you have probably seen. Uh, this is a very symmetrical part. I put here a line where also this second, uh, the right side snowflake is symmetrical, but of course it's anti-symmetric uh, um, with respect to this line. Now, again, I don't want to go into any detail, but also only want to show you again by quotes of uh, famous physicist Leon Ledermann, Nobel Prize winner as well, who says how important uh, symmetries are. So, fundamental symmetry principles dictate the basic laws of physics, control the structure of matter, and define the fundamental forces in nature. And uh, in this talk, in the remainder of this talk, I'm only concerned with discrete symmetries. There we know three, the symmetry between particle and antipart. I should not say particle and antiparticle, it's say charge and uh, the two species of electric charge, plus and minus. P is the mirror reflection plus inversion called parity, and T is uh, the uh, direction of time, forward or backward. And uh, so the real, the combination of C and P, so plus the exchange of, uh, of charge and parity, uh, this converts an electron into a positron and vice versa. So this we call CP and this connects particle and antiparticle. And there is a famous theorem uh, called CPT that is the application of all three of them. This, cre uh, this is a fundamental symmetry of nature and is not violated at all. So you should remember for the remainder of the talk that CP is the particle antiparticle asymmetry. Another Nobel Prize winner, T.D. Lee, uh, says fundamental symmetries of physics are based, uh, fundamental theories of physics are based on symmetry considerations, yet our world is filled with asymmetry. And I want to show you this on one example. And this has positive. The positron is replaced by a clear indication that CP symmetry is violated, this in nature. This is not a symmetry, a complete symmetry of nature like Dirac supposed it wouldn't be necessary for matter and antimatter to be the same. So there is an asymmetry in nature. And again, coming back to this curve, the question you would have to ask to an alien is whether to find out whether they are like we are with negative electrons in our atoms or an antimatter person whether this decay which particles in the which or which side is realized on their planet yeah? whether uh, or the, sorry, the decay would be again the same. They would have to be particle physicists who know how to produce this K0 long. And they would have to know that uh, they decay into pions, electrons, and neutrinos. You could all discuss this with these uh, alien um, scientists, right? And then you would have to, the important question to ask then, well, which particles, because plus or minus is just convention, right? I mean, we could 
call plus also minus and vice versa. So, but with this decay, with the asymmetry, we could, can absolutely define what is positive and what is negative. Positive charge is the lepton charge that happens more often in this decay. And so if we get this answer, okay, in our atoms, the question to our nine or eight orders of magnitude, which would be, which this CP symmetry violation is too small. So the point is, we have to search for new symmetries or new CP violation beyond what is called the standard model. So again, coming back to this um, picture that I showed you before, um, Big Bang and today, and you actually have to look at the time of the first microsecond or so. And what has developed there is the difference between matter and antimatter, which is of the order of 10 to the minus uh, 10 or so. Yeah? So out of 10, uh, 1 billion uh, particles, you have, or um, 1 billion and 1 particles, you had an equivalent of 1 billion antiparticles. And these 1 billion particles and antiparticles, they annihilated very early on here. But this one particle is left over, and this constitutes us. This is the matter that we see in the universe. And so the question is, how could this happen? I come back to the building blocks of the standard model of elementary particle physics. You see the leptons and antileptons. So I again use this notation of, um, of green and red for particles and antiparticles. These are the leptons, these, the uh, uncharged leptons, the neutrinos, and then the quarks, uh, the, three, the three families each. And uh, you search for new CP violation in, you can look in both parts of the standard model, uh, the leptonic parts and the quark parts. And I want to uh, briefly tell you a little bit about uh, the leptonic sector because, uh, well, part of my group is also working on this. And this is about neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are a very special species, they are the most abundant particles in the universe. About uh, in every cubic centimeters all over the universe, there are about 110 um, uh, neutrinos per cubic centimeters. So if you have a bottle here, they are also even here in the, in the water, yeah, everywhere. You have uh, a huge amount of neutrinos. They are produced in nuclear decay and fusion reactors, for example, nuclear reactors, the sun, and so on. And they are very, very difficult to detect. The background picture that I show here is a picture of the uh, Super Kamiokande detector. You may identify there uh, a small ship. Uh, people are, um, well, this is water, a water lake, so to say, covered by scintillation uh, by photomultipliers, a uh, couple of thousand that you need, and you fill up this tank of water and look for, originally it was built for proton decay, but now it's used for neutrino investigations. Actually, this was detector which discovered neutrino oscillations. Okay, neutrino oscillations, we have that funny phenomenon and uh, you have three species of neutrinos, which I showed you in this table. But they are uh, behaving very strangely. So what you have is, uh, if you start with an electron neutrino, at some later point in time, it will, also, it will, be, will appear as a tau neutrino, and vice versa. So it's somehow shows this oscillatory behavior. Yeah, you see it starts in this case here with uh, 
blue, I think, right? And then it turns red and so on. So it oscillates between these two flavors. And uh, this is not only true for these two, but for all three. I don't want to go into any more detail. But you can use this uh, oscillations. That's kind of a, a alpha and beta is now for electron, mu, and tau, yeah, these three flavors. So you can have a transformation in one direction and the other way around. Yeah, you see here, this is by time reversal. This would be a connection between neutrino alpha to neutrino beta to antineutrino alpha to antineutrino beta. This would be the correlation with uh, CP, the symmet combined symmetries of uh, charge and parity. And these are connected by CPT. So what you essentially have to do is you have to compare neutrino and antineutrino oscillations. And if there would be any difference, this would indicate CP violation. And you can use these particles that I showed before, pi minus, for example, which has a decay which produces at the same time a muon antineutrino and a neutrino to look at these uh, and compare the oscillations. And uh, there's currently a huge uh, experimental activity ongoing to set up experiments which study uh, these uh, differences. For example, one of my colleague in Jülich is helping to set up what is called the Young Men Underground Neutrino Observatory, Juno for, for short, in China, where they put a huge neutrino detector uh, in a triangle of uh, newly built nuclear uh, power reactors, uh, fission reactors, which produce a lot of neutrinos. And then they build a huge, gigantic liquid scintillator, 20,000 tons, 15,000 phototubes, and it has to be below ground in order to shield uh, background radiation. So construction is ongoing, and they hope to finish by 2020. OK, then uh, I realize that uh, Anne will also uh, discuss this from a theoretical point of view. I want to say a few words about baryogenesis. So there could also be a difference in the quark sector. Yeah? The lepton sector, I was discussing briefly now the quark sector, baryons. And uh, here we discuss nucleons. Uh, we have uh, the two nucleons are protons and neutrons. We know that they are not fundamental, but we also know they are the building blocks of atom, atomic nuclei. It's interesting to see or to realize that protons have a lifetime much, much longer than the universe. The uh, lower limit is 10 to the 33 years. But the lifetime of a free neutron is about uh, 11 minutes. And then you can also ask this side remark. You can also ask yourself, why are we existing if a free neutron is radioactive and would have decayed uh, in within 11 minutes? Uh, in our bodies, there are zillions of neutrons. And still, we are not very much radioactive. And we are stable, so to say, uh, for at least some dozens of years, right? And there are also antineutron nucleons. But OK, uh, this question, you may ask me uh, why this actually happens, um, that only a free neutron can decay. OK, then what we are looking for is a, a new property of uh, elementary particles, like the proton. And this we call an electric dipole moment. An electric dipole moment is, think about this blue-gray uh, circle. This uh, represents a proton or a neutron. Now, let's 
let's talk about a neutron. The neutron could be electrically, is electrically neutral to the outside world. But it could still be that, because there are quarks inside, that the center of gravity of the positive and the negative charge are separated by some small distance. And this would then be an electric dipole, like you have a macroscopic electric dipole, which is a separation of a positive and negative charge distribution. If you have, uh, say, a, a sphere, this will have no and um, a homogeneous distribution of charge. This will have no electric dipole moment. But it could have something that we call the spin. So a proton has kind of an intrinsic angular momentum, which we call spin. This is this blue arrow. Now, I take away a little bit of charge here on the top and put it on the bottom. And then it's no more symmetric anymore, and it has, say, this kind of uh, electric dipole moment. Okay? And the connection between the positive and the negative charge also defines your vector. And since in a fundamental particle like a nuclear on a proton, you only have this one direction, this electric dipole moment vector and the spin vector have to be aligned. So they are either um, parallel or anti-parallel. Now let's now assume uh, that uh, you have the time reversed object. You see the op time reversal operator T would make this rotation of the proton the other way around. Okay? And then the spin vector, this blue vector, this points not upwards anymore, but it points downward. But the electric dipole moment does not see anything from change of time direction. Yeah? It just stays plus up and negative down in my figure. Okay? So these are two different states, the left and the right one, and this is in not possible, and if you would observe this, this would mean that time reversal is violated. And this is why we look for uh, EDMs, actually because of uh, the connection of these three symmetries, C, P, and T, uh, which are always uh, uh, which, which are not violated uh, in any theory, uh, the violation of T is equivalent to the violation of CP. And remember, CP was the symmetry between matter and antimatter. So, uh, bottom line is, search for electric dipole moments to search for new CP violations. Think about that's a complicated inner structure. I don't want to discuss this. This is a cartoon of a neutron. Here, 50 years or so ago, and you see here the upper limits. Uh, these are measurements, always upper limits, and this is a logarithmic scale. And uh, you see it goes down, but seems to flatten off, and this is not a measurement up to now. This is uh, projected. Uh, result that people hope to achieve in the next in the coming years so um, yeah this is the I call it the background of a standard model so it's unmeasurably small you will not be able to measure an electric dipole moment of 10 to the minus 30 meters because this would then be four orders of magnitude even smaller even think about this uh, scale that I gave uh, before, but you may enter here, and this would be theories uh, which are predicting much larger electric dipole moments, so to say the motivation uh, for all these measurements, and partly they are already ruled out. 
What we want to do is measure um, the electric dipole moment of charged particles. So think about a proton or a deuteron circulating in a storage ring, uh, in a circular ring. Reason why you have to use a storage ring is very simple. You have an electric dipole. You have to, in order to search for it, you have to apply electric fields. Now what happens to a proton or a charged particle if it is uh, put in an electric field? It is accelerated, right? And so you have to put it in a ring in order to let it circulate. And then you apply a radial electric field and uh, if the vector is slowly out of the plane, and this is the observable. So we put protons in a storage ring, align the polarization vector in the plane of the ring, apply a radial electric field, and look for a slow growing of the vertical polarization component of this uh, bunch of particles. Now, because it's in principle a very simple experiment, but the smallness of the effect, it's about one nanowatt per second. So you have to maybe measure a thousand seconds, then it's still a microwatt uh, of movement. Uh, this makes it a very difficult experiment, very challenging experiment. So anyway, the goal is to go for electric dipole moments of 10 to the minus 29 e centimeter. I think I showed you here, here, sorry. 10 to the minus 29 would be here. So this would be a real major step forward. Okay, uh, you have to have such a machine. We have such a facility at Jülich which we call COSI. COSI stands for Cooler Synchrotron. You see here, well, it's kind of a racetrack shape. So it has two arcs and two straight lines. The uh, circumference is uh, 184 meters or so. And we uh, will use this to do first experiment. The first step towards this uh, final experiment, it's as a, well, I should mention it's a conventional storage ring. It has not these electric fields only, or mainly, but it has magnetic fields. So the particles are deflected by magnets. You see them here. These are dipole magnets. The orange ones and the, the yellow ones are um, quadrupole magnets and so on and so on. So problem is that the spin of these particles is connected with a magnetic moment. And this magnetic moment is so much larger that you have to fight uh, for, well, fake effects which come because of this magnetic moment in order to search for the electric dipole moment. And this is not possible with a, I call it a conventional ring. But it's an ideal test and development machine for electric dipole moment search. In the end, what you need to have is a precision storage ring, and you know the electric dipole moment doesn't. Okay, so there are challenges of, well, uh, we uh, define an international project or started an international project together with CERN. Uh, CERN is connecting people and knowledge.
we said that there is a violation in the TV violation. Does that come from the uh, right the left uh, hand policy for the for the I mean, this is standard electro weak uh, CP violation. Okay, this this is nothing beyond the standard model. This is just a fact that some symmetry is violated. I only sh took this example because I think it's the most convincing one that you have a asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Yeah. You can store yes. Yes. In containers, for yes. You can. Yes, you can. It's uh, you, you can store uh, antimatter. Uh, it's probably not like in Dennis Brown's uh, uh, novel. What? What is it? Uh, how is it called? Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, and and transport, bring it to uh, Rome to uh, do some disaster. But you can store it. You can uh, store proton, uh, antiprotons uh, or positrons uh, in containers, no problem. Yeah, and move it around. Yes. Yes. Well, this is a different, uh, this different kind of symmetry. We now talk, I talked about these three discrete symmetries, C, P, and T. And, um, uh, okay, this has, been, this has been found. I also told you it's not sufficient to, uh, uh, to, to uh, explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry. For example, if you would have this electroweak uh, C, P violation and say, okay, what would it mean? If I started from um, equal amount of matter and antimatter, then probably the universe would look very different from what we actually observe. It would maybe one galaxy in the whole universe, uh, and we know that we have 10 to the 9 or some, or even more. Right? So this is one thing. Uh, we look for additional CP violation. Supersymmetry is something different. Um, I, I think it is required because the standard model has some, a lot of deficiencies. One, I was implicitly mentioning these uh, neutrino oscillations, which show neutrinos have mass, and uh, this is not included in the standard model. But there are other deficiencies or other questions which you don't understand easily. And then, ingenious, clever, uh, theorists come up and say, okay, let's find something new. Uh, I frankly, I'm, I, I have my concerns. I have uh, my concerns for supersymmetry, uh, not uh, that they come up with something, and supersymmetry is very flexible and very, how should I say, uh, adjustable theory. Uh, so it is difficult to make predictions which are then testable. And then some people were arguing, and I think this is dangerous, uh, that uh, supersymmetry is such a nice mathematical symmetry that there should be some truth in it, independent of whether it's testable or not. I always say, okay, if it's if, if an experiment has not proven that something is uh, characteristics or a fact of nature, then forget about it. Yeah. I have, we have just one example. We have uh, had a disc or I had a discussion about um, the axon, which is some particle which is uh, required or maybe required for theory. And this has been simulated on a supercomputing recently, also in Jülich, and they found uh, a certain mass range where it could lie in. Now, 
independent of where assumptions that were made and it was a number of assumptions, assumptions that they put in in order to create a mass range, I think it has... Mr. Martin, I